2 Peter 3.18 But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Will you say it with me again? Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3, 18. Good job. I'm very proud of you. Cool verse, right? You have heard that verse probably a hundred times this year because it's made an appearance in a whole lot of sermons. It has been at the end of basically every service. It's been in the middle of quite a few services. It's been at the beginning of a lot of services. But I have a question I want to leave you with as we wrap up 2023. How can you tell if you have grown in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How can you tell if that's happened in your life? I'm not sure which part of that question, that verse, is harder for us to think about, growing in the grace of Jesus or growing in the knowledge of Jesus. And at first blush, I think we tend to gravitate towards the idea of growing in the knowledge of Jesus, right? It's not that hard to learn more about Jesus. But the text did not say grow in knowing stuff about Jesus. It says in the knowing of Jesus, in getting to know Jesus. Remember the Bible always emphasizes knowing Jesus over knowing about Jesus. Knowing about Jesus is simple. He was born where, church? You remember? We sang the song this year. His mother was Mary. How did he die? He, he was crucified, right? He preached a sermon where? On a mount. You got it. He preached more than 30 parables. He performed at least 37 miracles that we know about. These things are really important. They're part of the equation. But knowing about does not equate to knowing. What do you call someone that knows about a person but doesn't know a person? Well, I'll give you a picture of this, at least. Do these names ring a bell to you? Eric Swarbrick, Roger Alvarado, and David Little. Any of those names? Are any of you three guys here today? If so, um, raise your hand so the sheriff can have a meeting with you in the back. There's a very special place that you need to go. I'll tell you a story about each of them. Swarbrick drove 900 miles from Austin, Texas to go to Nashville on three separate occasions to deliver letters that he wrote to his lover, Taylor Swift, after she appeared to him in 100 Dreams. He is currently in prison. (laughs) Alvarado broke into Taylor Swift's apartment in New York City twice in one year. The police found him taking a nap in her bed and finishing a shower in her bathroom on the second time. I would say Taylor Swift's security guards probably are the ones who needed to be arrested at the end of this story. And Little. Little made the trip from Iowa to Swift's Rhode Island mansion. Who knew she had a mansion in Rhode Island, by the way? And claimed to be an old friend waiting for advice on breaking into the record industry. The news said this about these three. Each of these men were the same sick creep inside. They all professed love for a woman they never spent a second with. Here's my favorite line. They were in love with a Google search. (laughs) They knew about Taylor Swift. They did not know Taylor Swift. So Leslie told you what the word for these people was, right? They are stalkers. This is not romantic. If you think it's romantic, you've been watching the wrong kind of television because this is how you get to make nice friends in orange jumpsuits, okay? I am concerned sometimes that we have been Jesus stalkers at church. We know about him, but we don't always know him. Now, knowing about is part of knowing. I know a lot about Leslie. I know that if she's unhappy, all you have to do is throw chocolate at her. If it doesn't fix it, it will at least distract her long enough that you can get away. That's all you've got to do. It's, it's, it's a simple solution. You do what you got to do. I know lots about her, but I also know her. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus. Know about him, sure, but know him. The, the Pharisees, I think, were God stalkers. They could quote the facts and the figures. They knew all of Taylor's song lyrics. By 10 years old, the Pharisees would generally have memorized the first five books of the Bible. That includes Leviticus and Numbers, if you don't even know what the first five books of the Bible are. They knew about God. But Jesus said they didn't know God. Matthew 15, verse 8, These people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
growing in knowledge of God. I'm not asking us to be a church that has stalked Jesus. I'm asking us to be a church that knows Jesus. That's going to be personal. It's going to be a two-way street. It's going to be prayer that is, that is conversational, not performative. It's going to be study that is transformational. And it's not something that happens at a distance. And it's not something that happens in an hour on Sunday. It has to happen outside of that. Man, the Bible, the Bible says so much about this idea of knowing God. Jesus said in John 17, 3, This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets get in on this action. Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in all the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. It's a cool passage, isn't it? Know God. There's even James 4, 8. It's my favorite baptism verse right now. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So here's my question. In 2023, if our idea was grow, G-R-O-W, and by the way, I'm so disappointed in you. I, I had signs with a G-R-O and W, and nobody rearranged them to spell something weird all year. I just knew somebody was going to figure out how to do that. But no, uh, you, you really let me down. G-R-O-W. If growing in the knowledge of Jesus was our goal, do you know Jesus better than you did a year ago? Do you? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can so look deep down inside that black, crusty soul of yours and ask the question, do I know Jesus better than I did a year ago? I, I hope you've learned stuff about him. I hope you've learned a little bit about what he likes and what he doesn't like. But did you get to know him? Because if you didn't get to know him, you have missed what's most important. It's only one of the two things in 2 Peter 3.18. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus. Knowledge seemed like the easy one, but I'm not, I'm not sure it is. Grow in grace what does that little phrase mean? Well, grace is just a fancy word for gift. You know, sometimes we put church definitions on things, right? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C-E, right? You know, uh, or what's the other definition we use for grace? Unmerited favor. That's such a nice phrase. But you know what grace is? Grace is a gift. It's, it's a present. That's literally, if, if I were in Greek and I were trying to say, I got you a birthday present, I would say, I got you a birthday grace. That, that's the word. So don't make grace more complicated than it needs to be. Grace is God's gift for you. Really cool. So how in the world do you grow in a gift? That's a weird sentence, isn't it? Grow in a gift? I mean, I got a couple of shirts when I was younger that mom looked at me when I tried them on and said, you'll have to grow into it. <laughs> but that was because they didn't fit. And I don't think grace is a gift that doesn't fit. So, so what does it mean to grow in grace? <sighs> this might not be a great illustration, but I'm going to try it anyway. <laughs> have you ever been given a gift or, or, or had something in your life that you just didn't fully appreciate what it was capable of or what it meant? Okay, this is a bad illustration again, but Leslie bought a new car about a month ago. And nothing has made us feel older than buying a car with technological whistles and bells. Some of you are saying you're getting your comeuppance, kid. I know what you're thinking. It's making us feel pretty dumb because there's things you want it to do that you can't make it do. We couldn't figure out why the trunk wouldn't open. <laughs> Bad words were said. Because there's a big open trunk button on the dash, and I think... That when the car, you know, is in park and the key's on, I should be able to hit the magic trunk open button and the trunk should open. But guess what? You have to unlock the doors first. I guess the people at Subaru are concerned that you're going to throw someone out of the back of your car. I'm not sure. But now I know if I want to throw someone out the back of my car, I've got to unlock the doors first. It's very, very simple. I've got a plan figured out. We are growing in figuring out how this silly thing works. Someone who attends here had a, a truck, and it was really excited about this truck because it had the automatic headlights that turned on and turned off after a period of time. And, you know, if it's dark outside, the lights would come on, and that sensor quit working. Uh, it, it, it was the headlights, if I remember the story right, were on all of the time. And he complained to the people who took care of his car, 
And when he went into the shop, come to find out he had a stack of paperwork sitting on top of the sensor on the dash. And that was the reason the lights wouldn't turn on or turn off. But that person's here today. So I won't tell you who, who that person was, lest they feel silly. And I love that you're all looking around trying to figure out who it is. Signs your church might be judgy. You know, okay, let's, let's look around and find the guilty party. Sometimes we have things in our life that we have to grow in understanding to utilize and appreciate. Do you think it's possible? Peter might have been saying, church, you need to grow in appreciating the gift that God has given you, recognizing what that means. We don't understand the power and potential of God's gift. I think that one of the most tricky things of preaching is trying to convince people who need God's grace to actually believe that God was serious about giving it to them because it just doesn't sound right. And the other tricky part about preaching is convincing people who desperately need God's grace but think that it's for other people to realize that they too need God's grace. One of my favorite introductions to Jesus is in John's gospel. John does this kind of weird intro to Jesus. He doesn't take us to the manger or to Bethlehem or the genealogies. He sounds like the hippie gospel. He says, in the beginning was the word man, and the word was God, and the word was with God. And John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know this verse? This is the incarnation verse. And we have seen his glory, John writes. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of Grace and truth. That's your picture of Jesus. Keep going to verse 16, and it has this phrase that describes Jesus. For from his fullness we have all received, it says, grace on top of grace. That's a cool line, line isn't it? Huh. We need grace. But again, I don't think, I don't think we get this. Well, we have room to grow in this. It's funny. This is, this is a Matthew thing, okay? One moment I think I'm starting to appreciate that we all need God's grace. And I realize that I need God's grace and the addict needs God's grace. And God doesn't expect that I have been perfect, but then I'll meet a Pharisee and I don't want to give him any grace whatsoever. And yet again, I found a new place where I need to grow in grace. Grow in grace in knowledge. How do you know if you have grown in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I've shared several Bible passages with you about those ideas this morning, but I just I want to share some Matthew with you. Is that okay? I try to give you a lot of Bible, but sometimes i got to just give you what I think. And I don't like to do that, but this is the best way I need to do it. But to try to make up for it, I brought you a present. Is that okay? Um, is that all right? Um, I, need, I need a few helpers to pass these out. All right, this is a serving church. Thanks for volunteering. Okay. First, 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 you've been real judgy, and now you don't want to help. Okay, cool. Knew what next year's theme is going to be, Mark. You know. Okay, um, here you go. Just y'all take a handful. I think there's a few hundred of these. Take the box, do what you want. Oh, they're even in little bags. Look what would have happened if I'd opened the whole bag. There you go. And now we just leave Wes out to dry. So um, don't get too excited about this present I got for you. Uh, these are just simple little measuring tapes. Uh, you see them? These are like the ones like when you go to uh, uh, Fuzzles and they tell you that you're too fat for your coat. They, they pull this out to tell you that you're a, you know, you're a 53 foot or something like that. I'm not sure what they use. There's a lot you can use them for. Uh, on Amazon, they were marketed to people who, who did sewing and clothing alteration. Maybe, maybe you can use it to see how big uh, your biceps are getting right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, they don't make them that small. Okay. You see how big your gut's getting? Oh, that one kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. We're going to put that one back down. I, I set a high score on the scale this morning. It was pretty exciting. You know, it, it should at least put out a, put out a sign. That's what I always try to do when I pass those speed signs that tell you how fast you're going. See if I can set a new high score uh, when I go through those. Maybe you can use these to see how tall your kids are getting. I don't know. Let's see. I know this is going to be troubling for some of you, but it is centimeters on one side and freedom units on the other. Uh, so you can, you can maybe figure that out. You know, we have a door in one of our closets that tells you uh, how tall the kids have gotten. And we have a post-it note on it saying when Caleb doesn't need a booster seat anymore. He's really excited about that. At present rate, he'll be 45 when that happens. <laughs> Sorry, kids. You can use these however you like. There have been plenty of times 
that I've needed a measuring tape and didn't have one handy. One time we bought some uh, bookcases that didn't fit in the room. We really thought we had measured that, but it just didn't work when we put it there. You almost always can use a measuring tape. Uh, if you don't need it for that, maybe you just cut it in the links and use it as a bookmark. They'll make pretty good bookmarks for that. You can use that in your Bible. It doesn't work quite so good in your iPad, but I guess you can if you, you really commit to it. We measure a lot of things that matter. I know how many miles are on my car, what oil life I have remaining. In church, what do we measure? What are the things we measure at church? The most important measure is how long the sermon is. Okay, I know, I know exactly what you guys think about that for what it's worth. My average is 24 minutes, you jerks. It's not as long as you think it is. It just feels longer. I get it. Um, we measure attendance, right? And that's nice. We, we measure the contribution. That's a thing we can measure. Do you know why we measure those two things? They are the easiest two things to count that we have. Truly. And you know, those numbers... Um, They matter some, but they don't tell the whole story because, well, if I just handed out wads of cash, our attendance number would be far, far higher, right? Uh, Some churches don't grow. They swell. That's a thing that happens. That's not good. There are are predatory televangelists on, on the TV that will have far higher contributions than we will ever dream of having because they convince little old ladies that if they put their hand on the TV, pray, and write a check, God will pour blessings into their life. So, Measuring butts and chairs and dollars and baskets, it's something. It's not everything. My, what else could we, could we do to measure the church? Well, we could, we could measure baptisms. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Or, or, or how many people are involved in a, a mission trip? I'm just curious, how many of you have ever been on a, a mission campaign uh, overseas or, to, or here? Anybody? Tyler, don't shake your head at me. You lead the trip, you know. <laughs> That's a pretty cool number to see. That's a really cool number to see. How many of you have ever helped with storm cleanup, whether you've done it with Frank or on your own or somebody else? Anybody done that? That's a pretty cool measure. I like to see a church where there's a lot of hands that go up. You know, a cool thing, Carolyn's going to like this, a cool thing we could measure church's growth with is teachers, because Hebrews 5 verse 12 says, by this time many of you ought to be teachers and aren't yet. So raise your hand if you've taught in Sunday school in the last year. Carolyn, we have some room for growth, don't we? I think we do. I think we do. It's not maybe our best measure, but it's one we could look at. My grandparents' church used to have a board at the front, you know, like we had, it had the, the, the you know, first service, Sunday night service, Sunday school And they had a board that listed daily Bible readers. Do you ever see that in a church? At the beginning of Sunday school, the preacher would say, raise your hand if you read the Bible every day this week. And even as a little kid, I remember thinking, I wonder how many people lie about that so they don't feel bad in church. I don't know if that was a good measure or not. I guess I've always been a cynic. So what what can we measure if we're trying to measure growing in grace, in knowledge of Jesus. You know, if it was knowledge about Jesus, all I have to do is give you a 100-question text test, right? Uh, Multiple choice. Where was the wedding where Jesus turned water into Welch's? A, Cana, B, Firefly Farms, or C, Belmead, whatever. (laughs) Okay, right? But the knowledge of Jesus is different than the knowledge about Jesus. That's, I can't give you a test on that, growing in grace. And you know, it's it's easy to measure things wrong and to measure other people. Honestly, I've known some people in some churches that have been really interested in pulling out the tape measure in measuring the people who show up at their church. There's a church that I know about that I've been to a time or two that wouldn't let someone stand up and lead a prayer unless they had a coat and a tie on Do your clothes measure up to how we want you to look for this church? I don't know that I'd feel real good about explaining that decision to Jesus on Judgment Day, but you do you. Um, I know a minister no longer in this county who bragged to me about refusing to baptize someone because he believed that their marriage, divorce, and remarriage didn't measure up to his standard of repentance. I don't know that I want to be the one 
holding the measuring tape. It's pretty tempting for us to measure churches and measure sins and decide who's in and out and make that call for other people, but I don't think that's the measurements God's called us to make. You know Matthew 7. It's the judge not pass the judge not that you may not judge. A lot of times people don't make it to the next couple of verses. It says, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So you know what my standard is? I want to judge you wildly and accurately. It's my only hope. No. no. I want to judge you graciously and generously. Huh. Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know, what would happen if one time someone caught someone who was in the act of adultery and brought them to Jesus to see how he would judge them? What would he do? Let him without sin cast the first stone. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's a pretty good answer, I think. Pretty good answer. If you don't like it, I tell you who you can take it up with. Pretty cool guy. Pretty cool guy. How do we measure the growth of the church? We have two services. We didn't used to have two services. You know, that started, if you were at Trivia Night Wednesday night, that started in April of 2018. And if you weren't at Wednesday night, that's a measurement you didn't measure up to. <laughs> What do you do with measurements? They're tough. And what's tough is there is some validity in these things. Jesus said a good tree does not produce bad fruit, and a bad tree does not produce good fruit. By your fruits, you'll know them. So there is a sense in which there is some validity to measurement, right? So this gets, this gets tricky, you know, measuring stuff turns out to be really tough. I, I listened to uh, an audio book. It was the story of people who have climbed Mount Everest. Those people be crazy. Uh, and there's a whole story to all of the times throughout history that we have changed what the official altitude of Mount Everest is because it's such a hard thing to do to measure a distance terribly accurately, especially like that. Measuring is tricky. On one hand, though, if we don't do some measuring, we're never going to grow because we don't recognize where we are and how we have moved. Does that make sense? If we, if we don't spend some time evaluating these things, we don't have any, any milestones. You know, I hate how much testing our schools do. I think it's insane. But I think they need to do some testing so that we can tell if, you know, the kids are learning anything. So, so what's the happy medium where we're not being the church that checks to see if everyone measures up to us, but we're also not being the church where there's no measurement, no growth at all? How, how do we walk this line? Maybe this is the lesson. Maybe I don't need to measure you. I need to measure me. I think that would be a helpful lesson. But I think... I think maybe I have one that might be more helpful. Maybe the lesson this morning is recognizing that when I look in the mirror and I hold the tape, the truth of the matter is I don't measure up. I'm not good enough. I'm not nice enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not even ugly enough. I'm nothing enough. I don't measure up. I'm not, and neither are you. But here's the lesson I want you to hear. If this is the last sermon you ever hear in 2023, or ever, I want you to know the truth. You don't measure up. But you know what the gospel is? You know what the good news is? The good news is you didn't measure up but God who is rich in mercy. <laughs> he stood in the gap for you. He took that, that tape measure. He says, we're not, we're not looking at you. You're looking at me. We're looking at, at, at my son and what he has done and what he has accomplished. He lived his life perfectly, sinlessly, without fault. He didn't even mutter a bad word when he stubbed his toe. He is that good. And I will give you the gift of his righteousness. This is the doctrine we call justification. This is the idea that we call sanctification. You and I did not measure up. We never have. 
But thanks be to God for Jesus Christ because in him he has made us enough. If you are in Christ today, I want you to take this tape measure and I want it to be a reminder for you that God is rich in mercy to you. You weren't enough. This tape measure was not enough. This is not enough for you to get on any ride at Disney. But God has made you enough. Never, ever, ever forget it. Because of the death and resurrection, you now measure up. This week, Steve and Daryl were baptized. That's pretty cool. And here's what that means. Baptism is a picture of death. That's why we put you under the water. That's why we're picky about it being an immersion thing. We think this is reenacting of the death of Jesus. We are, we are doing more than waterboarding you in church. We are putting you all the way under. But Tommy Marvin somewhere giggles every time because he thinks somebody's going in the grave. That's a picture of baptism. When you are baptized into Christ, you are saying, I'm not enough. I'm dead. I am dying. It's a picture of all of that, but it is also a picture of death that doesn't stay dead. It is a picture of a new life, of new life emerging from the grave, emerging out of the water as a new person. This morning, if you feel like you haven't measured up, maybe today is the day that you put Christ on in baptism. And he says, son, daughter, you are enough. Or if you have been, if you have been buried with Christ in baptism, here's Here's your altar call this morning. Maybe it's time to recognize that, you know, it hasn't been enough. You haven't done enough. You're not good enough. Of course you haven't. You are just as dependent on the grace of God as someone who never met Jesus to start with. You need him desperately. Maybe this is the day where you say out loud to someone else, I need you. I need prayers. God, help me. Maybe today is the day where we all pull out our tape measure. And we recognize that there's not a person in this room on their own who is enough. But working in us and through us, God has made us enough. Isn't that cool? That's the measure I want you to pay attention to. In 2024, don't tell the elders I said this. I I don't care what the contribution is. I don't care what the attendance is, actually. God takes care of all that stuff. We're, We're good. We're good. I don't care how much you weigh, how fast you run, how much you have in your 401k. That's a really long race, by the way, 401k. That takes a long time. Uh, I don't don't care how how much money you have saved. I don't care what your cholesterol is. I don't care what your voting record is. Don't care. You know what I care about? I care that you know Jesus, that you grow in his grace and knowledge. Only thing that matters. If we can help you take a step in that direction, this is your invitation. We have a baptistry full of water upstairs. What a cool way to end the year. We also have a microphone right here and a church full of people who want to pray with you and pray for you. If we can help you, let us stand and sing.